A monohybrid cross is looking at only one trait, like we did in the last video. There are times that two traits need to be examined. This is called a dihybrid cross. Going back to Mendel, let's look at two traits he examined. The pea seeds could be yellow or green, while also being round or wrinkled. The allele for round is dominant, and the allele for yellow is dominant. We will use uppercase R to represent dominant and lowercase R to represent wrinkled, uppercase Y to represent yellow, and lowercase Y to represent green. With each parent having two of each allele, we can see that there will be 16 possible different combinations in offspring. These alleles are randomly shuffled in an order and equally distributed between the gametes. This means there should be predictable ratios in offspring. The Punnett grid here shows the cross of two parents, both heterozygous for both traits, uppercase Y, lowercase Y, uppercase R, lowercase R. Remember that both the homozygous dominant, uppercase Y, uppercase Y, and the heterozygote, uppercase Y, lowercase Y, show the dominant trait, while the only way to see the recessive trait is to have two recessive alleles, lowercase Y, lowercase Y. When two heterozygotes for both genes are crossed, the resulting ratio is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. This means that nine offspring may exhibit both dominant traits, either uppercase Y, uppercase Y, uppercase R, uppercase R, or uppercase Y, lowercase Y, uppercase R, lowercase R. Three may exhibit dominance of the first trait, but recessive of the second, uppercase Y, uppercase Y, lowercase R, lowercase R, or uppercase Y, lowercase Y, lowercase R, lowercase R. Three may exhibit recessive of the first trait, but dominance of the second trait, lowercase y, lowercase y, uppercase r, uppercase r, or lowercase y, lowercase y, uppercase r, lowercase r. And one may exhibit both traits as recessive, all lowercase letters. The Punnett grid on the right shows the cross between two parents or homozygous for both traits, one dominant and the other recessive. Notice that all of the offspring are heterozygous. Mendel's law of segregation, his first law, states that each gamete will receive only one of two copies that the parent can give. This movement of chromosomes during meiosis gives us this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Random orientation and crossing over were discussed in D2.1. Mendel's second law, the law of independent assortment, states that each gene is passed on independently of other genes. In other words, just because the pea is green does not mean that it has to be wrinkled. Mendel's laws only apply if the genes are located on different chromosomes. The gene for the color of the pea is located on one chromosome, while the gene for wrinkled or round is found on another chromosome. It can also apply if the genes for the traits are on the same chromosome, but far enough apart that crossing over or recombination can apply. To set up the gametes for the F2 Punnett grid, the FOIL method is used. This is the same method used in algebra. First, outer, inner, last. Remember that gametes have only one allele for each trait. So if a mother has the genotype heterozygous uppercase Y, lowercase Y, one egg will receive the dominant allele and the other egg will receive the recessive allele. The same for the father. If we look at a dihybrid cross and the mother is heterozygous for two traits, both round and color, each egg will have to have one allele for color and one allele for shape. This is where you would use the FOIL method. F is for the first. You would take the first letters of each trait and place those in one gamete, uppercase R, uppercase Y. Outer refers to the first and last letters, uppercase R, lowercase Y. Inner refers to the two middle letters, lowercase R, uppercase Y. And last is the last letters of each trait, lowercase Y, lowercase R. This would give you four eggs uppercase R, uppercase Y, uppercase R, lowercase Y, lowercase R, uppercase Y, and lowercase Y, lowercase R. Mendel did thousands of tests and found this 3 to 1 ratio in a monohybrid cross and 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio in a dihybrid cross. You can use an online database to find the loci or location of human genes and the polypeptide products. Using the information on the slide, you can find information about the ABO blood types. Let's open up the online database for the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI. When you get to the website, type ABO into the search bar at the top, then click on the gene. In the summary, you should be able to find the location of the gene. 
9q, 34.2, 9 represents the chromosome number 9, and q represents the long arm of the chromosome. So this gene is located on chromosome 9 on the long arm. The letter p would represent the short arm. 34.2 is the distance from the centromere. The larger the number, the farther away from the centromere. Find the reference sequence, abbreviated REF, SEQ, at the bottom. When you click on that, you should see the polypeptide product, histoblood group ABO system transferase. Your course instructor will likely have an activity in class for you to explore this software. You should try to find pairs of genes with loci on different chromosomes and also genes with loci that are close in proximity on the same chromosome. So far, we have talked about genes that are not linked. They are on different chromosomes. Or if they are on the same chromosome, they are so far apart that they can be separated in crossing over. Linked genes are considered any genes located on the same chromosome and are usually passed on to the next generation together, meaning that Mendel's law of independent assortment will not apply to them. A linkage group is a group of genes inherited together because they are on the same chromosome and are close to each other. When you see a genotype of uppercase G, uppercase G, uppercase L, uppercase L, or lowercase G, lowercase G, lowercase L, lowercase L, there is nothing about that to show if the genes G and L are linked. In order to show linkage, lines are used to represent these chromosomes. Each line represents a homologous chromosome and show the locus of the gene. The set of lines represents the genotype of uppercase G, lowercase G, uppercase L, lowercase L, or heterozygous for both traits. Recombinants are produced during crossing over in meiosis, and they are defined as offspring which possess new combinations of genes that are not found in the parent generation. Looking at the image here, you can see two offspring on the left, highlighted in yellow, are identical to one of the parent flies, while the two offspring on the right, highlighted in pink, do not match either of the parent's genotypes. Because of crossing over, a new combination that does not match either parent is created. You can see that because of crossing over, the recombinants demonstrate a gray body with short wings or vestigial, or a black body with normal or long wings. Neither of these combinations were present in the parents. Even though these genes are linked, crossing over can occur, though it is less likely. Chi-square is a statistical test that can be used in genetics to determine if what is seen in the offspring is what is expected, supporting the ratios that are expected based on probability. Cases in which sample sizes are small tend to show deviation away from the expected probability outcomes. Even Mendel, with all of his experiments, was unable to hit a perfect theoretical value. He looked at 7,324 seeds and got a ratio of 2.96 to 1 not the expected 3 to 1, though it was close. Scientists use the chi-square to see if there is a good fit between the theoretical model, which in this case were the expected ratios in a Punnett grid, and what really happens in nature. If you look at the chart, you can see the table of what is observed and expected when pea seeds with the traits of yellow and green, wrinkled and smooth, are crossed. Remember in a dihybrid cross, we expect to see that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Following the formula, you document what you observe, the first row of the table. You calculate the expected and place those values in the second row. The next step is to subtract the expected from the observed and square that number. The reason you square it is to get rid of the negative numbers. You then divide by the expected. The last row shows the answers. Adding those numbers will give you your chi. In this case, it is 4.81. You must then look at the chi-square chart to see if your number is different enough from the expected that you cannot say the offspring follow the ratios expected, or is your number not different enough and you can say that there is no significant difference between the observed and the expected, which means the results do follow the ratios expected. In biology, we use an alpha, or probability level, lowercase p, of 0.05. This means that there is only a 5% probability that the results are not due to chance alone and are therefore significantly different. On the flip side, there is a 95% chance that the results are due to randomness or random chance and are therefore not significantly different. The P is seen at the top of the chi-square distribution table. DF, or degrees of freedom, are calculated by counting the number of groups and subtracting one. We have green, yellow, wrinkled, and smooth, so four groups. Subtracting 1 gives us our degrees of freedom of 3. Degrees of freedom are on the side of the distribution table. You can see that our critical value is where the alpha level of 0.05 intersects with the degrees of freedom of 3. That number is 7.81.
Our calculated value of 4.81 is less than the critical value, so we will accept our null hypothesis that there is no difference between the observed and expected, as the number 4.81 would put our p-value at around 0.09, which is higher than the 0.05 threshold. In other words, our observations follow the ratios we expected to see as we wanted there to be no significant difference between the values, meaning in this case we were looking for the probability value to be above 5%. Keep in mind that this is not always the case when using chi-square tests, and many times you want to reject the null and not fail to reject it. To review, if your calculated chi is less than the critical value, you do not reject the null. Any difference from the expected values are probably due to chance alone, but if your calculated chi is greater than the critical value, you reject the null. Differences from the expected values are due to some other factor other than chance.